big man himself. I got to come up here and shake your hand oh and my. say thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Absolutely. And how does it feel to be back in person? Well, it's it's great because this is my first time here. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, there you go. <laughs> it's uh, it's the best time I've ever been here. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be full of uh, excitement across three days. And oh, absolutely. I just want to say you, you've been a, a role model for so many people, and I, I'm elated to have this opportunity to usher you in and give people a, a more intimate look into your processes. And you've set the tone and the bar uh, so high. I think if it's fair to say Michael has the bar and he took it and he threw it into like deep space and it may never come back. So big shoes to fill. <laughs> high five. Thanks, man. Okay. Once again, Michael. Thanks, Michael everybody. Uh, okay. Let me see if I can find my file. There we you go. Want, Michael, do you want questions during or save them for later? Uh, at any time. Okay. Fine. Perfect. Well, well, why won't you open? There we go. Okay, I think we're good. How about one more round of applause for Michael? Oh, my. <laughs> Let's see if we are going. No, it looks like the monitors are switched. I'm going to sit here and keep a All close right, watch on. on the fans. This one. Swap. Sweet. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, Woo! This is uh, going to be kind of geared around the making of this, this cool sculpt that I worked on with Jason Sadler, um, I'll just do a little background on me and how I approach uh, sculpting and, and think about form. Um, so I'm currently the lead digital sculptor at uh, Leica, which is a very good place to be. It's really amazing there and, and I enjoy it very much. I used to also work at Illumination and that was a very cool time uh, being able to work in Paris. And uh, before that, a lot, a lot of years at at Blue Sky. Um, let me see if this is going to go. Do we have pictures? Here we go. Okay. So I started out as a traditional sculptor, clay, and then uh, over the years, uh, eventually, by the time I got to Rio on uh, Blue Sky, um, that's when I really started using ZBrush in earnest. But uh, here we see just a few uh, of my early guys. And in those days, we'd sculpt in clay and take photographs and bring those in as uh, orthographic images and model them in Maya. And eventually, we were able to use uh, digitizers and then ultimately scanners and then eventually where we are now with ZBrush. So it's been a long, a long process. I've been doing this for quite some time and it's amazing to see how uh, how many different artists have have joined the ZBrush team from the traditional world. Um, this is an interesting piece. It's the, the yeah, uh, Rudy, the dinosaur there is all clay and the little pterodactyl is 3D printed. I really enjoy like trying to do like sort of um, suspended or sort of gravity-defying looking sculpt. So back in the day, it was a lot of tricks to try to get that to happen. Uh, but now we can do a lot of cool things when we're rendering in ZBrush. But you also do need to think about how it's going to look when you uh, are doing it in a print. So again, some more clay sculpts. This is for Horton. This thing was interesting to do. Um, this is for Horton. I ended up sculpting the whole thing, and, but the feathers were done in a plate mold, so I sculpted about 10 different uh, graduating size feathers in a flat mold, made a silicone mold of that, and then poured up resin, and then I could heat the resin and bend it and stick it in there. And that was bad enough, but the guy who had to make the mold for this, Peter Kelly, I felt bad for him. It was rough, but he somehow managed to do it. And just a couple more. Clay sculpts. Here again, I, like I try to enjoy doing these sort of gravity-defying things. If you are doing this kind of stuff, a little, you know, uh, in clay, a little note is with these guys, uh, I used a TIG welding rod instead of aluminum armature wire. It's very bendable. You can get it in a hardware store. 
but it's really strong and bendable. So that's what I use for that staff and his legs. I know this isn't ZBrush, but here we are. Now, finally. So, uh, so I started uh, on, on Illumination on the Lorax, but then we did uh, Despicable Me 2 after that. I did not do Gru, but he's just in there for reference, and that's Lucy, I did her. A Couple more poses. Normally I don't do color. Um, it's fun, but for the most part, uh, directors tend to like seeing uh, gray models in the beginning. I had some Secret Life of Pets. This is all just obviously sculpted fur, just to get the volumes. Those are fun. So here's the Lorax stuff, and uh, a whole bunch of characters for that, but this is a real, real fun one to do. And uh, this is Minions. The guy on the, uh, on the right is just the original version of, of this other character, but I saw it was fun, so I put him in there. And then the, the evil family from Minions. A couple more villains. And these guys went pretty quick. Like, I would do these in about a week or less just to bang them out. Um, just to try to, because they weren't going to be in there very long, but try to concept them. And that's what's really great about ZBrush. Now this, I did uh, some work on the SpongeBob, last SpongeBob movie, which was a lot of fun. I pretty much just did these expression uh, and story moment sculpts, but my favorite one by far out of all of them is this one. <laughs> it's just, you know, that was so fun. <laughs> it's crazy. Anyway, so there's a couple other characters I did. And this uh, just, I threw this in because this was the last clay sculpture I ever did for production. It was one of the Ice Age movies, I can't remember which one, 25 or something. <laughs> but um, it, was, it was a lot of fun to do. So uh, I want to also talk about how I approach sculpting. It's not specifically like techniques, but just how I think when I see a design. Uh, it's basically hierarchy of forms, thinking in primitive silhouette contours or cross sections. Uh, I've done this talk before, so hopefully if you've seen this, uh, bear with me, but it still applies. So hierarchy of form is when you have a character that's extremely complex and where do you start? So this is an alien I did for Alien Resurrection. I also worked with Sean Cusick, Alex Levinson, and Tom Kushwa on this, uh, but I built the head and the torso. So when you look at that, you know, you start to look at the big forms, you have to get those blocked in first. You know, then your secondary forms and your tertiary forms, because it all has to base on the big forms. And, and basically all uh, sculpting, whether it's realistic or not, or, or stylized, it depends on that. So cross-section, oh, that's a fancy slide. Um, uh, cross-section, you know, think of like, you know, slicing a loaf of bread or how a 3D printer works. Just thinking about when you're looking at a design, uh, here's a great drawing from Peter DeSev, and like in the middle of that face, like it's hard to tell what is that form. So you can either, you know, do what you think it is or talk with the designer and have them do cross contours and things like that. That's a really good way to, to understand uh, the shapes as you go. Here's another kind of example of that. Uh, what all those shapes are as you go through cross-section. Also, like with the tail, you see where that little section C is. It's kind of a, a weird lemon shape, but at the very tip, it would be just an oval, and thinking about carrying that form, transitioning it or uh, all the way through is really important, and that helps you just figure out a, a roadmap for sculpting. Silhouette, obviously important, because uh, not only just the overall shape and the, 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 the uh, recognition, recognition or, uh, of the character in silhouette, but also for the contours, uh, like for curves and straights and uh, convex and concave shapes. Also that silhouette and contour is good for getting sense of movement and flow, uh, alternating rhythms and forms, and that's a really good thing to think about because that's what I think lends most of the life to uh, some of these sculpts is just not letting it be too uh, stiff and getting some movement and fluidity. And then I think most importantly, thinking in terms of you know, primary shapes, uh, cubes, spheres, ovoids, cones, etc. And so 
here you see that similar kind of vibe as well as the hierarchy of forms sort of illustrated there. And then just one last sort of example of this is like if we look at Sid's head, like I'm looking at a drawing, how would I think of that? So like the top of the head is a small section of a, of a big sphere and the nose is sort of a large section of a smaller sphere and so on through the forms like sections of, of cones or sections of torus, toruses, tori, I don't know what that would be, but them. Um, and same thing, moving down all the way to the, the tertiary uh, forms. So when you kind of put that all together, you think about, you know, how the large shapes fit, where they blend, their cross section, their intersection, curves and straights. Um, and also like that at the very top, you see that echoing curves. That's specifically with this design, like not just radiating uh, symmetrically out, but, you know, the, the sort of look of picture design things, those are, those are things to look for. Uh, there we go. This is another great example of why ZBrush is so awesome because this is not ZBrush. And this took a solid week of sanding to get this thing that smooth. Uh, so thank you for that, ZBrush. Okay. So here again, like all of those simple things, like most of what I do is, is stylize simplified characters. And I, th my point is that all of that sort of approach that I was just describing works its way all the way up into high resolution, high, highly detailed, realistic uh, models and sculptures and figures and whatever. So you can see here, these are your basic, you know, David, uh, Michelangelo David plasters or ideas. Um, and so all of those shapes are, can be very complex when you're not sure what you're looking at. And these are kind of ways that I map it out to understand how to, how to create those forms. Um, one little note on that ear, um, a quick little ear anatomy lesson. Uh, so that little nib that's right there in front of the opening, that's called the tragus. And uh, it's funny because uh, you'll, I'll mention this later, but anyway, the, uh, the anatomy of an ear is very complex, and I always tried to put in at least a little bit of it in the stylized characters, and we, we just had these discussions back and forth about how simplified to make them, and uh, yeah, the, the, the tragus was always a, a bit of a problem for designers. You so, know, you, you, Mike, anyway, yes? Do you know sometimes if you get water in your ear when you're swimming, you can use your tragus, and you can... See? Push the water out. I think that's what it was designed for originally. Yeah. yeah, it's like a little self-suction. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a little... Like that. A little suction button. And then, <laughs> tragus. To know. Brought to Speaking you by of Kinkin. tragus, Jason Sadler, he's the guy that... Uh, and I joked about the tragus a lot. So um, we also decided to name this Colossus uh, uh, Tragisius. So he... Uh, Jason Saddle is an amazing designer, worked with him at Blue Sky for years, and this is his information. You should check it out. He is great. And a uh, hell of a, a dancer as well. And so here's a couple of designs. This is one from Rio that uh, was his design that I sculpted, another one of his personal projects, um, some expression sculpts. And this is one I really just went fully for ZBrush, was on Rio, and I realized how amazing it is and how great it is for iteration and uh, just speed of production. So some more expression sculpts there. So we get to this point where we decided to collaborate. We had done a couple before, and we said, well, let's make something cool, and we decided to go with this uh, design. He had been working on some characters like this before, but this was really where it started. Uh, okay. Oh, a nice slow slide coming in. So one of his inspiration boards was this really crazy sculpture, a Bulgarian monument. Uh, it's super brutalist, cubic, planar forms. Uh, you also see in there some Art Deco stuff, which is, is similar. And so that was sort of the beginning of his uh, shape language that we were looking at. See ya. Okay. Uh, so that as we were doing that, I realized I needed to make these very stylized dimensional forms based on his uh, you know, beautiful drawings, which are very graphic, and how do we translate it? Translate it? So this is the, some of the sculptures at the Hoover Dam, you know, 1930s deco stuff, the gargoyle and the Chrysler building, 
which is amazing. And that's Margaret Burke White, by the way. If you don't know her photography, it's awesome. Look her up. Some more Art Deco stuff. So this is sort of the uh, inspiration for me to like, try to figure out how I'm going to deal with making these planar forms. Uh, Stanislaw Zakowski, amazing sculptor. And then here again, looking at how to make some really hard edge and curve edge uh, forms go together. Scott Eaton, amazing uh, anatomy instructor and sculptor. And uh, Alexi, this really great sculpt as well. So this is sort of preparing my brain for starting uh, sculpting. So now we go into the time lapse portion of the presentation. Um, so, it, you know, sometimes I'll start with like really simple forms and uh, cubes and spheres and push them together. It, if the form is, uh, the design is really simple, I'll go with that. Um, but sometimes I'll just start with a, the demo head, which is what I'm doing here. Um, even though this thing is going to be extremely uh, stylized and crisp edged, I, I generally have a sense of how I'm going to get there. So roughing it out, and then at this point, I start using uh, H-polish and uh, pinch a lot, damn standard, obviously. So it's uh, a lot of that kind of back and forth, a lot of smoothing, reworking, smoothing, reworking. Uh, obviously, do a you know, zero mesh to get some better topology to work with, and obviously not worry about animation. It's just to get some edge looping. Um, I try to do that for as long as I can to have uh, the multiple levels of resolution because it just helps with modifying the large forms. So, you know, going in, cleaning, sharpening. Um, I'm just trying to look at my time. I don't know where. So, so you're going to give me the thumbs up, right, at a certain point? Like, all right. So, uh, you know, here I could have. Okay. All right, I'm going to go all day. Uh, so, yeah, so here again, you know, simple graphic shapes where I could do what I'm doing here, like for the hair, making large shapes and uh, for the beard and so on, but I just sometimes just, just jam right into it. But with H-Polish and Pinch and Damn Standard, I can get that look pretty easily with, uh, you know, a more generalized form. So, in the end, uh, we didn't do this specific hair that I was just working on. We decided to make it a little bit chunkier that instead of making a character that is uh, the actual, let's say, animated character that would be in the, a, a story or a film, it was more like what would a sculpture of that guy look like. So we ended up redoing the hair a little bit, making things a lot more uh, stylized and chunky. And then here again, just pushing stuff around and polishing. So here's that first pass. And again, like I said, the hair, we decided was a little bit too detailed. We we're going to go with a bit more of a, uh, a chunkier, more kind of thinking about the Statue of Liberty, basically. So then coming in and refining shapes, obviously getting great notes from uh, Jason. He's really uh, one, of the, one of the best uh, designers in terms of, that I've worked with in terms of being able to like, see the forms and give the really precise notes, so that's very helpful. But here again, using all the topology to help me get those shapes, uh, just, you know, sort of my old school, I wouldn't even say old school, but back when I was doing actual film assets and doing Maya and other stuff that needed proper topology, I just always liked that, and it kind of goes back to that idea of those, uh, you know, the simplistic, you know, avoid spheres, whatever. Uh, I kind of think of that with the low res uh, form as well to, to just guide where those big shapes are. I would like, you know, to have an edge going along the jaw, et cetera. I mean, that's pretty simple stuff, but that's generally how I think about it. Here again, you can see where I'm using damn standard. Uh, once I do a polish and a clean, I'll uh, usually come by with uh, damn standard, but pushing out uh, and, and create a little bit of a, a ridge. And then I can smooth that back or polish it. It just helps take care of any uh, a little bit of wonkiness. So this is basically the, more or less the finished head. A couple little things changed on it, but not much. Yeah, so, now that's a major tragus. Tra tragus Maximus. Exactly, Tragus Maximus. That should be his name. 
All right, we might have to take a vote on that later. <laughs> okay. Okay. So some, uh, you know, just more. Wait a minute. Am I going back to the same one? Yeah. Somehow, I've gone back. That's weird. Uh, all right, there we go. Sorry about that. So this is the final look of the hair. Um, when I was doing that, I generally was using, like if I'll do like capes or anything, thin sheets like that, I'll work with a single-sided thing, shape it as much as I can, and then, uh, you know, extrude. But I had been definitely getting into using the dynamic subdiv a lot, which is great. And the one thing I'm doing here, if you don't hopefully go into convulsions watching the speed of this, um, <laughs> I was going for some animation in that hair, so that, like that, that uh, or implied animation. So basically, as a the the locks come around, they're sort of open at the back. Then they start to curl a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. And as they come up to the ones on the top, they start to unfurl. So it's it's almost like each of those locks of hair is sort of a step in sort of like a, like a replacement animation in a way. <clears throat> Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Are you just using planes at that point? What in the very, yeah, in the very beginning, just using planes, and then I'll you know do either uh, you know an extrude and the dynamic subdiv. Yeah, you know, basically Z modeler all over the place on that. And then at a certain point, I had to with those little curls at the bottom, I had to uh, basically have the thickness to deal with the tightness. Can I just it. say something? Mm. If I stand like this and I get a blowout. Yeah, I think that that's uh, it's pretty it's pretty accurate. Yeah. Like, but I need the blowout. Okay. Yeah. I, and you can't see any tragus. Uh, well. Not yet. You might see a lot of tragus on Saturday night. On oh, Saturday. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, let me see where we're going with this. I just make sure I got the right slide. Sorry. That looks like the same one. All right. Anyway, so sculpting body. Um, at this point, if anyone is offended by uh, stylized anatomy, you might want to turn away. Um, anyway, so here is, again, think, um, I'm getting into the anatomy part of this. So, again, hierarchy of forms, simple shapes. This is a guy from my anatomy app I did a while back. And uh, you can see, basically, where the, the bony landmarks are, the, the sort of square pieces and then the round pieces. So I was trying to think of that as I'm going along. And here's the body after it was done. And a lot of this got covered by the, the costume, but I thought it would be pretty cool to do anyway. So speaking of anatomy, you know, you don't have to know everything, but I'll tell you, these, these are my go-to books right here. Some of them I saw are in the Noman uh, shop. Um, the old school ones, George Bridgman, you can't go wrong. Uh, he's great. And in particular, he draws in a way that's really artistic, not just technical anatomy. The forms are all there, and it's really great. Uh, Steve Rogers Peck, uh, Andrew Loomis, and Edward Lantieri, all great stuff. And some of the new ones, um, <clears throat> the Anatomy for Sculptors book, um, uh, the Elliot Goldfinger, Human Anatomy, also the Paul Roche one I, I don't have here. But these are great go-to books. Okay. Are you going to go? Where's that button? There it is. All right, so for the most part on this, I just used, you know, the demo soldier guy and moved him around. But for the leg, I ended up using those multiple forms like we were talking about. Uh, in this case, because it was so simplified, I, I wanted to have those separate shapes to move around to decide what I was going to keep and what I was going to get rid of. And so... Working on the, the glute, got to have that. And then, uh, yeah, so, you know, the major forms, the extensors and flexors and, and all that stuff. And just trying to figure out, like, how can I get this to fit within the vibe of the drawing, but also um, have some sort of anatomical nod, you know, some of... So, for example, like the, the calf area, the whole gastrocnemius area, it's like just one big sort of diamond shape, but where I put the angle, 
uh, of, of sort of the mass of the muscle is what I was looking at. Um, and those are the kind of things that the knowledge of anatomy is, is definitely important, but you also, more importantly, trying to get a, an appealing shape. Here again, just looking, uh, going with these sort of square forms and round forms and then deciding where to you know, crease the stuff and pinch it to uh, amplify the, what the anatomy is and again, also just keeping it as simple as possible. And at this point, I'm just sculpting all this thinking, I know it's all gonna get covered, but I was actually kind of having fun with this as a challenge of, you know, what can I, what can I do to make this look cool and, and again, have the anatomy, but uh, I knew it was mostly gonna get covered anyway. But it did serve as a basis for making the armor. And here again, just using a lot of H polish, pinch, uh, Damien Standard, a lot of masking too to sort of block off an area so I could get a nice crisp uh, form. So with these hands, this is again like I believe the standard guy or this this uh, or the demo soldier, not sure which, but just breaking that down, getting rid of as much topology as I can to just have exactly what I need, just a, a box for the joint or the, the the middle of the finger bone itself, and then three uh, lines for the joint, just so I can get the shape really, really simply uh, at first, so I know the volumes are good. Obviously stretching it out because this guy's a little bit lanky. And then um, you may see as I'm doing this, I, I found a really cool little trick for doing fingernails, and it's essentially you have, it's, you can see the square on the top. I do an insert, or an inset, and then just push the two uh, edges on the back or the two points on the back under the skin and the two in the front over. And you get a really, once you smooth it, you get a really nice little nail shape. Then obviously you go back in and curve it and everything else, but that is a really quick way to get a, a good fingernail foundation that's not like it's just laying on top of the finger or, or something strange. So you'll see it, uh, there's a bit of a time lapse on the, the foot and you'll see it a little bit better there. Here again, just working on getting these basic forms in place. And just, I gotta say, I really love Z-Modeler. It's awesome, especially for this kind of stuff. So here doing the foot, same thing. Um, just getting all those shapes right. And then, um, again, because it's a stylized character, there's a lot to get away with. But at the same time, because it's simple, doesn't mean you kind of just make it basic. There's a sort of a, a flow and a, a, an elegance to how you sculpt this stuff to get the form to look right, especially when it's really simple. And it may sound silly even with these simple guys like this, but looking at like classic sculpture, you know, Bernini, Michelangelo, Carpo, Houdon, um, all the classic uh, Greek and Roman sculptors, uh, they're just, the way they do form is amazing. It's just not perfect, that, that it's perfect anatomy. It's just the, the anatomy is there to support the, the, the flow and the grace of those forms. And especially for hands and feet, just look at those old masters because that's where, that's where the good stuff is. So here we go. Here's our guy. And I just kept the arms and hands and uh, feet detached because I knew they were going to get covered with, uh, with armor. Oh, that's just starting that over again. Okay. Well, come on now. Here we go. Okay. So then we were, uh, you know, once Jason was looking at that, we were refining it. I roughed that hand out as best as I could, but he gave me these great drawers uh, to sort of finesse the shape of that fist. Uh, hand posing is, is really important too because like, uh, first of all, modeling hands is difficult and then posing them is difficult. It's, there's a whole set of uh, the, the emotion that hands do, like are, they're, they're almost as expressive as a face. So getting in there and again, looking at the masters and how they pose hands is really, uh, I think important. That's where I get most of my sort of vibe on how I do that kind of stuff. So for example, if you look at that, 
uh, drawing of the hand on the bottom, you know, it's not, it's holding that staff and it's not just gripping it, you know, it's kind of graceful and that one finger is out, like, it's, uh, and that's just a classic old school way of, you know, the masters would do. You look at the Statue of Liberty, the way she's holding that torch, you know, that sort of a thing. It's very, it's very simple, but it adds a lot of uh, life and quality to uh, your hand poses and, uh, and all the other poses as well and for the rest of the figure. So here, just going in and obviously trying to clean up, uh, get rid of all the wobbly bits. Uh, generally, what I'll do is I'll sculpt out as much of the form as I can, try to get crisp edges and whatever and move it, and then I'll come in with my move brush. And one of the things I do all the time now is I just make the, the brush radius, uh, you know, whatever it's going to be, but the focal range, like uh, focal value, like really small, so there's a huge drop off. So that outer circle to inner circle ratio is, it's almost like, uh, well, I don't even know what to say. It's, hey, it's, it's very big fall off. What material are you using? They're asking online. Uh, that's a, a sort of a variation on Skin Shader 4. Uh, it's something I made a long time ago, and I, I've since forgot how to make it. So <laughs> I can, okay. I, you know, I, I don't even know. I have, that's the other thing, too, folks. Uh, I am old school, brutal ZBrush user. I do not know too many tools, and um, I, I just kind of hammer through it. Um, I do always look at everything on the new versions and try to find new stuff. And I, I, I add things to my roster all the time, but I guarantee you I'm probably using like 2% of the power of the system. Uh, but I always try to learn more stuff. But you're using 100% of the 2%. I'm using 100% of the 2%. That's right. Right. And that's the most, <laughs> that's the most important percent. Okay, so finishing out some stuff here again, like a lot of, you'll see I'm inflating in those knuckle areas. So again, I'm doing all these like planar forms, uh, but I'm also giving them, uh, trying not to make them absolutely dead flat, giving them a slight uh, uh, convexity, uh, just so that there's, it's not too, you know, uh, robotic looking. Are we to shout out sure. Where are you at? Put your hand up. Uh, um, what do you call it? Um, topological selection, you know, when you drag down along the, I, you know, I, uh, I don't make too many poly groups either. I'm just, I'm just too old. So <laughs> I just, I, I can just do one group, not poly group, uh, but no, seriously, I do the poly grouping more and more nowadays, but that's what that was. Just, uh, topological selecting. There's another question back here. Yeah, you. sure. Yeah. Remesh in between, or I mean, I never see you remeshing. Oh, oh yes, I do. I do Z remesh a lot. Um, so that particular hand, though, was the same base model. Well, it started as the base model from the ZBrush uh, uh, demo soldier, soldier, or the the simple. What's the little the simple guy's name? What do they call him? Average man. Average man. There he is. Super average. Super average. average. Super average man. Super average man. But yeah, I just used that and chopped the hands off, and then I did remove some topology, but it's pretty much the same. So going into the armor. Um, so this was the the base model with the armor, and then I started to pose it. He's, you know, pretty straightforward, and I started to add a few things. I realized that. To hit the drawing, the torso was very uh, shifted, very uh, skewed. So I had a little bit of trouble just, you know, messing around with trying to make it not look completely distorted. So it's definitely, it's definitely distorted. But uh, at this point now, I'm starting to do the, the uh, detail, the little raised uh, filigree. And I generally tend to paint it out first. I'll, you know, flood the thing with white and I'll paint black uh, in poly paint. Uh, just to figure out a roadmap, and then here again, going in with Z Modeler and extruding, uh, creating the, all the polys, as you can imagine. But this gives me a good starting point because at least I've got something to follow. Uh, and obviously, after I get it set, I'm going to extrude it and work with that.
and then, uh, you know, after I do that, I'll come in and clean it up and I'll start inserting edges to try to crisp it up and keep all that stuff looking good. Um, I don't do a lot of like creasing and that sort of thing because I pretty much just, you know, figure I'm going to ultimately try to 3D print everything at some point, even if I don't. So I try to keep it all like in the geo. So some of these got some weird artifacts where the, I was doubling up uh, edge loops to keep it crisp, but, but I would go in with some, you know, smooth or, uh, sorry, H polish, and it pretty much took care of all of it. I mean, if you go into close inspection on this thing, not the model, but the, or the printed model, but the actual thing, it's, there's some, quite a bit of wobbly bits in there, but I just try to decide what I can, what I can get away with. Uh, typically, I'll only really sculpt for two views, so like a, a full body and a bust. Um, I don't really worry about getting in too deep and uh, detailing out shoelaces perfectly. It's not specifically what I do. So it kind of, for maquette sculpting, which is primarily my gig, uh, you know, I just want to hit it, have it work from, from two views, get it good, ship it, move along to the next. Um, so that's why you'll see there's a lot of my techniques here are kind of rough. So again, the usual here, just trying to get some edge looping in so I could get this guy set. Um, and here again, this strap for the boot I just kept as, a, or the sandal I kept as a solid block because I knew it was gonna print and I didn't wanna deal with uh, the thickness. Plus I also knew it was gonna be like only, you know, an inch uh, or so big. And what else? Or again, you can see I'm using a dynamic sub div. I really have been getting into that a lot, which is cool, because you could just, uh, in the past, I would just res it up and start modeling. If I had to remesh it, I would. Here's about as fancy as I get. I made an actual insert multi-mesh brush with curve. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yes. Sweet. There's a question on here coming in through the annals of the internet. Um, they want to know how many hours of work goes into a sculpture like this. Well, um, you, you, you don't want to see the first and last timestamp on my files because it was like six months almost. Not quite six months, but it was a long time. But I would say if this was for a job, um, it's hard to say exactly. I would say probably two to three weeks, something like that. How um, many hours a day, two to three weeks, like per day? Like Just like one. <laughs> No, no, like in an eight-hour day, you know, if I, was, if I was doing something like this for work, yeah, it would probably be like I would bid out two to three weeks, depending on how many iterations. Weeks, eight hours a day. Yeah. Business days, not weekends. Oh, business. Like, well, if this I worked on every day for, right. just, to, just to present to you lovely folks here. Uh, but, uh, no, I, you know, don't work on weekends. Why do that? <laughs> So here's, here's the final version of that one. Um, while he was still close to the original, you, you could see he's, um, I have a better picture here coming up, I think. Yeah, okay, so on the right is the original drawing, on the left is kind of where we went with it. We decided that uh, we wanted to push the, the design a little bit more. So you can see on the left, I tried, this is the first pass of the completed thing, keeping it as fitting the silhouette as possible, uh, very straight lines that, um, and, and the, again, the best I could to fit within the design. And then after that, Jason and I were looking at it and sort of thought, well, what else can we do with this? I was, I was curious about the hand, the downward hand that was open. I thought we should do something with that. So we ended up coming up with, uh, with a fist, which is good. And then he also came up with this idea, let's shift the whole body mass a little bit, uh, especially because what well, you'll see here in a little bit, it's gonna be sort of a colossus out on an outcrop of rock, and it would kind of lean out towards, you know, out to sea, that kind of thing. So this is where we ended up. Some of the masses changed a little bit, um, but I think it turned out uh, really a little bit more alive and, and just kind of a little better with the, the weight shift. The one on the left is really cool too, but that is, uh, that's where we ended up. Let's see. Oh, 
one more turn around here, I think. And then we also were starting to think about color at this point. Um, we originally was thinking of like this sort of Statue of Liberty, verdigree, uh, patina copper. Like, how would they build this thing? Um, now, the, the Statue of Liberty is done with a technique called repoussé, which is that you have a, a framework and you you basically hammer sheets of copper into a negative, and um, to get the shape, and that's all riveted together. So we were thinking it could be that. So that's where the color scheme came from. But we also thought let's do some some separation of uh, of color. Oh, wow, you can see my mouse. That's awesome. <laughs> a separation of color uh, just to help accentuate it. So that's, uh, that is where we ended up with that guy. Okay, so now the base. This went through multiple iterations. So this is one of the earlier designs. And uh, this is a little bit later, just to show you some of the cool drawings that Jason was giving me on, on direction. I didn't have this to start with, but this is kind of what, what comes back. Oh, there we go. So, you know, classic box modeling, um, and just cranking through it. Trying to keep these big, simple shapes first and not worry about the, the secondary forms for a while. I don't have anything exciting to say at this point. <laughs> so. But you know, it, it is cool. I I, uh, I really do enjoy. I did enjoy this part because I'd been so focused on all these, you know, tiny little notes and details and keeping all these like uh, animation forms in place. But by the time I got to doing this base, I'm like, oh, thank God, simple rocks. This is great. I just want to let you know you have 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Yeah. Perfect. Any questions out there? Don't be shy. Oh, way in the back. Hang on one second. Yeah. I see, I see you. Oh, look at who it is. You never know who's going to be here. Um, I had a question about your decision-making process and the proportions of the character. Because it's like the arms go all the way down to the knees, which is really interesting because it works, but it's also kind of like very exaggerated. And that voice is the voice of Eric Keller. Hey, thanks. Round that's a good question. And that's actually a Jason Sadler question. That was his design, and uh, we just wanted this thing extremely lanky. We did actually adjust the arm lengths because once we had it to a certain point, uh, we ended up adjusting that a little bit. Um, but yes, he's an extremely uh, lanky fella. That's a great question. I would encourage you to ask questions because Michael's here in the flesh on the stage. Yes, right up in the front. Mike Morgan. So just for fun and practice and just side missions, like, uh, do you stay within the same style or do you try other styles? Or what do you do, like, when it's not paid work and you're just kind of exploring? I don't know that I don't work for <laughs> unpaid. No. <laughs> no, that's It is in DAY he's working. No, I, I really enjoy this kind of stuff. Um, I, I also like doing, uh, like, uh, cars and things like that, like just uh, more uh, hard surface modeling stuff. Um, but it's it's a good point. I, I just generally tend to go towards this type of look. I've done a few realistic things here and there just for fun, and uh, you know it just takes a long time, and I don't want to, you know, spend all that much time on various things. So it's just, I just I dabbled in hyper-realistic and then just kept coming back to this type of thing. You had a very poignant piece some time ago with a, a woman on a motorcycle that I often like. That was actually, that's Otto a good... Schmidt? Is that an Otto Schmidt? Otto Schmidt, yeah, that was... That. I mean, I just, I do love seeing just amazing designers work and just like, that would be cool as a sculpt. And, and that was fun because I just spent a long time building that, that motorcycle. But she's also pretty, they're both pretty stylized, but... Uh, a little bit more realistic than some of the stuff I normally do. Sure. Oh, right up front, Shane Olson himself. People online have said, I spotted a Shane Olson in the wild. Oh, yeah, he is right hey, there, up, the man. man. So um, I had a question for you about, I see you box modeling a lot in here, traditional modeling. So before ZBrush, before Z Modeler, how much experience did you have with box modeling, and, or did you start with ZBrush? 
No, I started uh, well, way back on uh, with Alias and Softimage and then Maya. So back in the, uh, well, even before Blue Sky, before Ice Age, you know, I was doing traditional, you know, box, actually a lot of spline and nerve stuff back then. Um, but yeah, I, I've done a lot of that and it's, it, it is how I think a lot of times with how I'm working on in ZBrush too. So at this point, just kind of to wrap up, you know, so we decided to do the base uh, because uh, the great folks at Mamaki uh, w uh, worked with Paul and I to, to print this thing. So here I'm building the, at this point, some of the foam. It's going to be a separate element. Now this sculpt you'll see in a minute is uh, out in the, the gallery out there. I'm just going to move ahead just have a couple minutes, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've got to about 12 minutes. And okay. good point, because there is a gallery show happening uh, just here in the Noman Gallery. You can see this piece on display in its physical realization. You know, it's been realized physically. Don't touch it, but you can look at it. Yeah. Uh, and quickly, the boat. This, I started with something I bought, legitimately bought online on TurboSquid, but it looks completely different now. A lot of times I'll do that. I'll just buy a model, for either get one for free or buy it, and uh, I don't ever pirate them. But it's just something to start with. So this does not look anything really like the thing I started with. It's extremely chunky looking because it's only this big in the print. But I figured it might be interesting to see that. And then this is the final model with the base. And again, like I said, the, the folks at Mamaki uh, printed this thing out. And we made the water clear, which is pretty cool. So I'll just show you what some of that looks like. All right, here we go. So also just needed, the original design had just what you saw before, but because of these ankles were so thin, I was concerned about it breaking. Uh, it probably would have been fine, but it would have been sort of fragile. So Jason and I came up with a thought, let's do a cape to help support it. And this is sorry for the like, free range navigation here, but uh, just to show you, like, I tend to build the cape things uh, for, like this pretty thick, and then I'll thin down the edges for the illusion of that it's thin, but in that center, it's pretty thick core, and that's really where the strength is coming from. And... Michael, real quick, how big is the final piece in inches? He, the figure is 12 inches tall. It's 12 inches tall, okay. Yeah. So here's the final look, just with a, a render showing some of uh, what the water might look like, and a little couple of close-ups. And then this is how I separated it out. Uh, the, the figure itself is one piece, the base is uh, a piece, and the boat, but the boat is sort of hovering there. So the water was gonna be printed clear, so I separated that out, and I separated the foam out. Uh, I also decided to build the spear myself because I was concerned, A, about the print size, and B, that it might be really fragile. Anyway, this is how I normally key. I'll use just a truncated pyramid and do a live Boolean, make the, the cutter just slightly bigger than the, the female, slightly bigger than the male, so that there's a little room for glue, et cetera. Booleaned out for the spear, added like 0.3 millimeter gap so that it could go in. Could you talk about the cape at all for a minute? Yeah, I did, just a little bit. Did, did you have a question? Or? Yeah, they, they'd like yeah. to know more about the cape. The cape, uh, yeah, it was basically uh, started with a sheet, and it was actually a, a, a circle, a disc, so that the center was around the neck, and I just stretched it all down so that I could, when I started dealing with all of the folds, it was nice and concentric uh, patterning. So then for the spear, just... 3D printed it and decided to use some telescoping brass rod. That's a four millimeter rod. And then two telescoping down to two millimeter. Um, so that allowed me to mount the thing. Also, hello from Point Pusher. Wonderful uh, as always, he says. Okay, Danny, Danny Williams. Williams uh, probably the reason I started using ZBrush. So shout out to the amazing Danny Williams. Danny Williams. Woo. All right, so here it is assembled. And I did a couple of color swatches with the folks at Mamaki. I just figured out some colors I might want to use, made a color block, and tried to match it as best I could. 
And here it is. It's over in the gallery. You should go check it out. It's really cool. Yeah, you could clap for that. Are you kidding me? Make noise. That's yeah. amazing. That's like full circle. Look at that thing. Yeah, it turned out great. And, and again, it's, it's amazing that they can print with multiple materials in the one print. You'll see the water. I mean, that, that base was all printed at the same time, and obviously they were able to somehow use multiple materials at the same time, so it's in there floating. I think it's great that you talked about the modular and, and compartmentalized approach to modeling this type of thing for this purpose. Yeah. And uh, I think I speak for like everyone around the world who's watching and in the studio audience that that's, uh, that's really great. And thanks for doing that. I mean, it's really informative. Well, that's it. In total size, I you think you said 12 inches for the, the sculpture, and the, then it looks like the base is about 3 inches. So uh, let's give it about 16 inches total height. Yeah. Yeah, from, from the base, the bottom of the base up to the top is probably about 16 and a half inches. Yeah, and uh, their printers are really, really good. I just I really dig how it turned out. And that's it. Thank you very much. That's amazing. Michael DeFeo, ladies and gentlemen, a little louder on the first day here at the ZBrush Summit. My goodness. Don't forget, don't forget to check it out inside the gallery. You can see it in person. And yeah. that's gonna, maybe Michael will be around. You might be able to get a photo with Michael and the sculpture. Who knows? Oh, wow. Maybe. Sure. I'm, not, I'm not rolling you under the bus there. Um, let's see here. I want to thank all the people online for watching. Thank you so much. It's really all about the fans. And uh, we're really happy to see everybody here in person and online. Excellent. We're going to say one more time thanks to Michael. Thank you so much. A great thanks presentation. Thanks, everybody. Day one at the Zebra Summit. Louis Tucci here live. <laughs>